speaker is a visitor from Canada. He is uh, Daniel Butsante from the University of uh, Dalhousie, Dalhousie University, and he's a professor there. So although he's coming from Canada, he's originally from Argentina. So he did his undergrad in Argentina and then moved to Canada to do the master's and, and PhD. He spent, after that, he spent several years in, uh, at the Fisheries Research Institute in Silkeport in Denmark, working in several EU projects. And then he came back uh, with, uh, to Canada to Dalhousie with a Canada Research Chair in Conservation Genetics. So he's contributed quite a lot to the conservation genetics of uh, fish, uh, both uh, marine and, and uh, freshwater. So today he will be speaking actually about uh, something that is in between the two. So it's an atom species. Uh -huh. so, um, Thank you. Thank you, Scar. I'm delighted to be here. Pleasure mm -hmm. and an honor to uh, be able to uh, uh, talk to you about the research I've been doing over the last few years. As you can see from the title of my talk is Diversity in Salmonids and, and Other Fish Populations, the Role of Life History and Habitat Fragmentation. Um, I'll be dealing with uh, each of those topics in turn once I figure out how to, now it's not, uh, this is not moving. The arrow keys, yes. Oh, they're not answering. Ah, oh, there. Thank you. So, uh, just to get this over with, uh, and, uh, what I'm going to be talking about is not work that I've done in, in isolation, a lot of uh, collaborations, uh, including former PhD student, uh, Chris Opalstra, uh, Devon Johnson, a master's student, postdocs, uh, Gomez, McCracken, and so on and so forth, including Oscar. Uh, um, in some of the work that we're doing now, and if I have the time, I'll talk to you about that towards the end. So a little bit of the outline of my talk, I'll give an introduction about genetic diversity and how I measure genetic diversity. By uh, genetic diversity, I mean the effective population size. I use effective population size as a measure of diversity. I'll talk about estimation methods, and I'll, I'll mention that effective uh, population size is generally lower, smaller than the census population size. Then I'll, I'll, I'll go into the uh, topics uh, two and three there regarding the role of uh, life history variability in the uh, maintenance of genetic diversity, and then temporal dimensions and spatial fragmentations. So uh, what is uh, the effective population size? As a brief, briefly, uh, the definition is the number of individuals that would give rise to the observed loss of heterozygosity or variance in allele frequencies if they bred in an ideal manner. Ideal manner means that uh, the mating is a random and uh, reproductive success doesn't have a variance that is larger than a Poisson variance and um, things like, like that. So um, I'll, again, once again, I'm using the effective population size as a measure of diversity. Uh, before we move on, I just want to make a distinction between uh, uh, two types, two broad types of effective population size estimates or constraints, uh, contemporary versus long term. And a uh, um, number of people, it's easy to confuse the, the two. When we're talking about <laughs> contemporary uh, effective population size, uh, we are talking about uh, the uh, diversity that uh, is maintained and occurs over the, if you, if this is, oops, if this is a, a time axis over here with present at the bottom, past on the top, uh, the last few generations are depicted in this uh, variance over here. That's what we take into consideration when we are talking about contemporary effective sizes. And it's based on uh, things that are related to genetic drift and uh, linkage disequilibrium among markets. That's how you measure it. It's the effect of those of those processes: genetic drift and small population, 
and uh, linkage. When we're talking about long-term effective site, we are talking about a, something that includes the role of uh, mutation, and uh, uh, we're talking about the average of the effective size to the coalescence of uh, this variability that you can find at present, how far you, know, you, you consider mutation along this long-term uh, <coughs> temporal scale. Um, <coughs> so long-term NE, uh, we're including mutation rates and the coalescent process. Contemporary NE, we're only referring to DNA can, that can be measured through genetic drift or linkage and things related to that. A little bit uh, further complication is when we measure effective size, we may have systems that have discrete generations or systems that have overlapping generations. Most of the organisms that we work with would have overlapping generations. And you can measure uh, effective size using um, <coughs> temporal methods. That is, you measure allelic variance in one uh, generation here, you measure it again a few generations later, that's a measure, uh, uh, the allele frequency distribution will differ, how much they differ is a function of the size of the population, because genetic drift is inversely proportional to the effective size, so you use that to estimate effective size. Uh, these uh, estimations are further a little bit uh, more complicated when you're dealing with assistance with overlapping generations, because every year these individuals of different ages are contributing to uh, the next cohort. But uh, those are details that, that, that I don't want to focus now. But the point is that we're going to be talking about this effective size, and the, uh, you measure it using uh, linkage and drift. Some li little brief introduction from textbooks, uh, we know that the uh, from an experiment from this person very in uh, 60 years ago, nearly 60 years ago, starting with uh, uh, 107 replicates of uh, Drosophila, 19 parents per generation, uh, the variance in allele frequencies increased uh, with increasing generations, and they increased in a binomial, uh, following a binomial uh, sampling variance. Um, he used uh, 16 parents in each line, eight males and eight females. And so uh, what we see from here is that the variance increases with uh, a increasing number of generations, and the increase is faster in smaller than in smaller in larger populations. Okay? So that's all those basic principles. Um, <clears throat> when uh, they compared the uh, loss of heterozygosity in that, in that study on Drosophila over time following those 19 generations and using the theoretical decline in heterozygosity, which is uh, at time t is the original minus this uh, or times that product there or that, that, that number there where n is the size, uh, <clears throat> they get, uh, if they use 16, they get this uh, slope. If they plot 16 here, then you get this slope. But in reality, taking the average of those 107 lines, they had this, this other slope. Where the, uh, and you obtain a slope like this if you put a 9 there. So the effective size of those Drosophila experiments conducted 60 years ago is 9. Whereas, uh, while in practice, the experiment had used 16 Drosophila. So why is it that the effective size is smaller than the census size in each, in each line? Uh, well, um, there are issues that make the effective size smaller than, than, than the census size, and it's because they depart, systems depart from the ideal situation. You could have unequal sex ratios, there could be a variance in family size or reproductive success that is higher than the Poisson, and fluctuation in population sizes through time. We're going to talk about these, the, the, the ones in yellow, they're probably, well, in the other experiments, the Drosophila experiments, probably high variance in family size that contributed to that uh, faster decline or to uh, the effective size being smaller than the, the 16, than the census size. How much smaller? So we know that NE is smaller than N in general, but how much smaller is it supposed to be? 
and there's been several reviews, uh, well, a couple of reviews, one in the 90s by Frankham, uh, who uh, um, concluded that on average across different taxa, mostly vertebrates, um, plants and terrestrial things, uh, <coughs> the uh, uh, ratio of NE to N was 0.11. More recently, my former PhD student, Palstra, uh, came up with uh, we came up with this other number, which is close to the original 0.14. Bottom line is that any is generally smaller than n. In some cases, it's a lot smaller with marine fishes and so on. But that's not what we're getting into now. Let's say that we have a one order of magnitude any smaller than than n. These ratios are not fixed. They can change over time within populations. Uh, um, <clears throat> but although the genetic attributes of populations may change as populations' uh, densities change, and so these ratios might, might change, in general, again, we have any smaller than n. And that's one, one, one first uh, uh, take-home message that I want to take, to take into consideration because we're going to see something that violates those results in a, a little while. So uh, what are the methods that we use? We can estimate effective size using demographic methods, but we usually need a lot of information that we often lack for a particular system. We need uh, uh, in, uh, information on survivorship, fecundity, generation time, and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, lots of work. Many, for many species, we cannot do that. So we use indirect methods. We use genetic methods. And so there's three general methods. One is loss of heterozygosity over time. It's a method that I showed before. It's usually a, a good for lecturing a, a population genetics course, but it's not really all that widely used in practice. Um, <clears throat> the, method, the second method, it measures the temporal little frequency change. You take a sample at time zero, a sample of the same system of time T1, and measure the change in allele frequencies, and that's a temporal method. And finally, the linkage disequilibrium method, that for which you only need one sample. You measure the linkage, the departure from equilibrium between pairs of loci, and that again is a function of the effective size. So those are the methods. Um, <clears throat> is it useful to uh, look into effective sizes? Uh, can we predict? Uh, that species under conservation concern would have smaller effective sizes than, than species that are not under conservation concern. And so it's, again, that review by Friso, Palsa, uh, and, and myself, uh, we found that in general, species that in the literature are depicted as being under conservation concern show uh, smaller effective sizes than uh, populations that are considered stable or exploited. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, <clears throat> can we use that as a prediction of uh, the a, um, likelihood of, of uh, uh, is it useful for conservation? It's, it'll be, uh, this plot will show you that we find stronger uh, correlations, the solid dots, between heterozygosity and effective sizes for systems that were considered isolated, so isolated uh, fragmented systems and uh, isolated from neighboring populations. So only when populations are isolated uh, does the effective size decline or heterozygosity and effective size are, are, are correlated. When uh, the uh, systems are open uh, co under connection, that correlation breaks down. So what this is telling you that uh, here we have a link to habitat fragmentation. Habitat fragmentation, less connectivity, um, uh, any is a better predictor of, um, uh, or heterozygosity and any are better correlated. So, so, so far I've linked, talked about a little bit about uh, a, um, <clears throat> habitat and life histories. I want to talk about the, and here I press the, the button that kicks me out of, uh, our point by mistake. Sorry for that. Thank you. Um, 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 and Pasra, who finished his PhD a, a few years back, 
talked with uh, uh, or worked with Atlantic Salmon in Newfoundland. And I don't think I need to uh, spend uh, any time on uh, describing the life history cycle of, uh, of life cycle of salmon in Scotland, but uh, suffice it to say that uh, there are anatomists spawn in freshwater. Um, uh, at some point, they become par, smultify, go out to sea, come back. That's what most of them do. Importantly, some of them mature as par without going out to sea. And that's the life history uh, uh, stage that uh, will become important in a little while. So you have, uh, they mature and they, they uh, contribute to uh, spawning in some cases. So um, <clears throat> the region where this work took place is in Newfoundland and a little bit in, in southern Labrador in eastern Canada. Uh, the area has uh, lots of salmon rivers and many of them have been monitored over the long term. Um, <clears throat> um, that has stopped to, to a large degree most, more recently, but we had uh, some views of, of the different rivers, different sizes um, in, in the region. What we had to, uh, to work were archived samples collected uh, start, starting in the 1950s, uh, 60s, 70s, up to the 2000s. These are scales, which are uh, scraped off a fish stored in a, a brown uh, envelope and kept, kept uh, dry in the basement of the Fishing Institute. And then along came Friso and uh, took those uh, scales and extracted DNA from the nucleus that's attached to those scales. Um, <clears throat> it can be done. It's a bit harder than, than working with fresh tissue, but it can be done. And so we had a series of temporal samples for a number of rivers um, <clears throat> around Newfoundland view of what a microsatellite uh, gel looks like. Uh, he worked with 14 loci and some of the samples. Uh, I want to focus, focus on two regions. This is the whole of Newfoundland. Uh, this is the Avalon Peninsula. St. John's is over, over here somewhere. Uh, the Avalon Peninsula and the northeast Newfoundland. So these two areas are the areas where I will focus at right now. And what I'll, I'll tell you is that these populations are much more isolated from each other than these ones in the north. So here we have the samples from the Avalon Peninsula and uh, these three, NEP, NET, and BB. And this is one, NEP, uh, NET, and BB is here, Bisky Bay. What we see is that Northeast Brook Trapassi, one of these samples, is quite different from the other ones. This is a, a two-dimensional plot of the FST estimate. So, and what we see too is that there is temporal stability. Different samples collected in 97, 91, 2000, 95, they are more similar to each other than they are to the rest of the groups. So these populations are fairly isolated. If we look at the ones up here, G uh, Gander, Middlebrook, and Terranova, they're in the middle there. Um, so northeast blue capacity is isolated. Sorry for that. And we look at these ones here. They are fairly, uh, relatively well connected. So we have a contrasting uh, pattern. Isolated populations here, more well connected populations in the northeast. So uh, <clears throat> if we now focus on life history diversity, I want to bring in uh, the uh, work of a uh, recent uh, master's student, Devon Johnson, a uh, bright fellow. He went on to do a, a MD PhD in human genetics. I lost it because uh, how hard it is, probably how, uh, to him, how hard it is to get a job in evolutionary biology. So uh, he worked with these uh, samples from a, that, that particular system, Northeast Brook Trapassi, which is isolated. I just show you that it was fairly, fairly isolated from the rest. From this sample, we had about 30 years of data, collected data, uh, which, which, which were counts of uh, uh, anadromous fish coming out, and oh, sorry, of uh, small coming out and anadromous uh, salmon coming in. 
uh, and also a subset of those accounts of those individuals were collected for uh, uh, were, were taking the samples from which we could then use for DNA analysis. So how do how do we uh, count this? This is a counting fence uh, set up uh, the, in this particular way to catch the uh, outgoing small and kelp. Um, <clears throat> kelp, the mature fish that have already spawned and are going out to sea for the second time. Um, this, this, that Cutting fence can also be set up this way to catch the incoming anomalous run, which turn out to be mostly females in this in this in this area. Another view of uh, the system, the counting fence, is people that are hired seasonally to come into the uh, fence and count how many salmon there are. They count them, they let them go, and sometimes they take a sample. And they did that for. Uh, well, since the 1980s. So what sort of data do we have? Uh, we have uh, from starting in 1984, this is this first column is the anatomous run size in the hundreds, 100 fish, 164, uh, 65, and so on and so forth going out. We have, uh, I'm sorry, anatomous run size coming in. Uh, the small run size it's about 1,000 or thereabouts, so we have this data, kelts, and the percentage of females among the kelp. So we have the counts of the anonymous one, small, and, and kelts. Turns out that the anonymous one is, is mostly, but not exclusively, uh, females. And then from those numbers, we uh, <coughs> took samples for, well, there were, there were samples taken and we used them for DNA analysis from the small and from the cat. Those samples were, those individuals were also aged and so such that we could assign the samples to cohorts and uh, we run a suite of, uh, suite of uh, microsatellites on them. So here you have the, the cohort samples and uh, those, uh, 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 the, the, the cohorts from the smalls and the cohorts uh, from the kelts. That's the day those individuals uh, had been hatched. So now we have a, a cohort information. So uh, <clears throat> what do those, do those numbers look like on a graph that's easy to interpret than a, a, a table? So here we have these field circles are the, uh, the entire anonymous run through the ages, so the, through the time since the early 80s to 2011. And uh, uh, also the, the separated, this is subset of those anonymous fish, the large ones, uh, which were considered separately. <coughs> so far it's so good, but what we have here, these inverted triangles on the top, those are the effective number of breeders, the, which is related to the effective size, uh, using the linkage disequilibrium method, using one of the methods that I briefly introduced at the beginning of the, of the lecture. And the lines are the confidence intervals um, down, the lower. Uh, but what we see is that this genetic estimate based on linkage disequilibrium microsatellites is higher than the, the counts. The effective number of breeders uh, is larger than the anonymous run size. Hmm. So that means that the NE is larger than NC. Um, <clears throat> and that goes against what I said at the beginning, that NC, uh, NC is usually larger. The sensor size is larger than NE. And NE is really one-tenth of the sensor size. But here we have the opposite. We can also estimate the effective number of breeders using the demographics, and we have this formula from Sewell Wright that the uh, <clears throat> effective number of breeders estimated from sex ratio is, is this, this quantity here. And so we have these numbers, number of males and number of females. So uh, <clears throat> we happen to have that information for every year that we have data and so we can calculate um, the 
S is sample size here, small run size, kelp percentage. This column is the sex ratio based number of breeders based on kelps. Uh, the effective number of breeders based on, uh, obtained by sex ratio in kelps assuming some differential mortality and the same for smalls, for small. Uh, but then we, we in, in this last column, we have the genetic estimate. Let's see what, uh, how they compare on a plot. These inverted uh, solid triangles are the uh, uh, sex ratio, the effective number of breeders based on sex ratio of the small. One year prior to spawning. Um, <coughs> The same thing, based for, but for the kelps. That's based on sex ratios. Uh, same, but with the, some assumed differential mortality between sexes. And up on top, we have the uh, the linkage disequilibrium method again. Once again, the effective size obtained with genetics is not only higher than the sensor size of the anatomy run, but it's also higher than the uh, demographically estimated effective sizes. The effective sizes estimated from the sex ratios of the anatomous runs. <coughs> so uh, this is against uh, contrary to what one would expect. And no matter what genetic method we use, as depicted by these uh, histograms here, uh, they're, all of them are higher than the estimates based on sex ratio. And in, in fact, it's also they are also higher if we include a measure of uh, uh, fluctuation in temporal in, in, in population size through time. Um, <clears throat> so the question, the obvious question that jumps to mind is, well, where is all that genetic diversity coming from? Why, why are our genetic methods uh, uh, giving us a higher estimate of genetic uh, uh, effective size than the demographic methods? And the answer may lie in, in the role of mature par uh, <coughs> that, that exists in the pond upstream and then not being counted in the anomalous run. They mature and contribute to reproduction without being uh, uh, going through the counting fences. And so uh, <coughs> they contribute to the census size and so we're not um, considering them when we look only at the anatomous run. They make a very significant contribution to genetic diversity. <coughs> can we estimate how many par are contributing to reproduction? And yes, we can. Otherwise, I, use, I say that uh, I will ask that question in a seminar. So we have this, this uh, um, uh, ratio here. We, have, uh, we know the number of females and the number of males and we know uh, the effective size obtained by genetics methods. And so we can ask how many more males do we need uh, to add to the equation for this uh, number obtained from sex ratios to be similar to the one obtained by genetics. And so one example here, we have data from 1993. The genetic method is giving us a, an estimate of 131 but the anonymous run size was 96, with 74% of them being females. That means 71 females, 21 males. That's 96. How many more males uh, do we need for this 96 to become 131? That's 60. That means here we need 35 males. Is 35 is 35% uh, of 60, 58% uh, of, of uh, total number of 60. So. Um, <coughs> Uh, we can say, infer, that in this particular year, 58% of the contribution by males came from male power to the production. 50 of the contribution from males came from mature power and not from the anonymous males. We do that calculation for <laughs> not all of the years that uh, we have data for, and it turns out that uh, the mean contribution from male par is 76 with a median of 85 over this period of 30 years. Quite, quite astonishingly high contribution from uh, the mature par. Maybe a different system. Um, some of it 
you might argue come from a connectivity, but uh, uh, we should show that uh, this is a system that is fairly isolated, so connectivity is not important. So uh, uh, <coughs> the conclusion was that uh, uh, power in this system contributed very significantly. Okay, what about uh, structure and gene flow? Most populations are not totally isolated, and gene flow can vary. What the message that I want to make here, or uh, make across here, is that the, the gene flow can vary in magnitude and direction over different time scales, and those time scales can be very short. Uh, we can estimate gene flow in several ways using Bayesian methods, uh, using, me in fact, using methods Oscar has. Uh, uh, developed with the students, and so we're go, going to look at these two systems again: the uh, Northeast Newfoundland, which is again well connected; the Avalon system, relatively isolated populations. Here we have um, um, <coughs> the three systems in the Avalon Peninsula. Recent migration: you can see that Northeast Trepassi is 0 0.20s, 0 0.20s, uh, regardless of what. Of what time period you use between 80 and 87, 98, 88, 93, and so on and so forth, they're smaller. So we can ignore those, and we get migration between these two uh, populations, and we see that uh, in this period, 98 to 93, there was migration in this direction, which was about five times uh, higher, or an order of magnitude higher than uh, <clears throat> at the same time that uh, this this might be 0 0.07. It's a lot smaller than this. So in this period, there was migration this side, this, in this direction. Some time later, in the 90s, it was migration in this this other. Migration again asymmetric, and can uh, <coughs> sometimes this gene flow. The direction of that gene flow can change over a short period, and the same happens in the northern, more well connected systems where we see these numbers. Uh, increase in this uh, are 0 0.04, 0 0.10 almost, nothing in the period before, and uh, quite high in the other direction, and so on and so forth. So populations, ex ex uh, these populations ex exhibit relatively high connectivity, and those patterns, again, of connectivity can change over relatively short periods of time. And so what are the, the uh, uh, consequences of that is that uh, the wild inferences, uh, those patterns of connectivity can change in populations that this decade are behaving as sinks could very well have behaved as sources last decade or a few years back. So this has implications of how um, we uh, design protected areas and corridors. Uh, taking uh, single temporal samples may not be uh, uh, the proper way to go if you want to get a proper understanding on how populations are connected in a temporal, in a spatially fragmented system. <clears throat> so now I'm going on to the uh, last uh, uh, topic or last uh, uh, point, I believe. So how do we estimate genetic diversity in a fragmented system? And this is something of what has brought me here to to work with Oscar in a project that we're collaborating uh, uh, <clears throat> on 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 these issues. To make a, 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 a complex story uh, more short, um, I think uh, what I'm going to say here is that we're dealing with comparisons of the effective size in a packmated system. How do uh, these measures of diversity, effective size, compare to the effective size in a metapopulation that is in a system that is frag spatially fragmented and that consists of uh, several uh, <coughs> populations that are connected mi by migration, but the total size is the same as this one. So if we go back to Sewell Wright under the island model, he uh, concluded that the effective size of a total system, panmictic, would be equal to the sum of the effective sizes of each one of the subpopulations divided by 1 minus FST. FST is a measure that goes between 0 and 1, usually very close to 0. If you divide something for, uh, for this number for 
by something that is less than one, it's going to give you an effective size that is higher than the effective size of a palmitic system. So that's also doesn't make much sense that a fragmentation will increase that uh, short-term diversity. So it's easy to understand the 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 uh, uh, that that so-called paradox, if you want. The, it's related to the fact that this island model has very restrictive assumptions that all these populations are of equal size, size doesn't change through time, and importantly, migration is symmetric. And every, every population contributes equally to the pool. So those are the assumptions that lead to these. So we can ignore that. But following that, there was a, a flurry of uh, um, statistical or analytical developments by uh, starting with Wright, Mariama, and Nani, and uh, other people, including Whitlock, uh, <coughs> and Barton, and uh, quite a lot of uh, analytical fireworks um, uh, looking at how do we, uh, is, it, is this true? Can we think that, uh, can we demonstrate, at least analytically, that the effective size of a fra specially fragmented system will be smaller than the effective size of a palmitic system of equal total size. And yes, in fact, as soon as you introduce asymmetric migration, then the effective size of a, a, a fragmented system becomes smaller. Right? So, um, uh, we try to, there's a lot of analytical developments, little empirical work. Since I like uh, field work and empirical work, so let's go and try this uh, thing. We did it in, uh, uh, with three species, spawning salmon, brook trout, char, in a mostly linear system in Newfoundland. Uh, we have seven lakes, one, two, three, four, five, six, six and seven. The water flow is, well, some samples of field work, uh, lots of mosquitoes and black flies. Uh, pike nets being quite successful haul there, setting up the pike net and some scenery. Um, uh, sampling is non-lethal because this is a national park. And so water flow is in this direction. We have waterfalls uh, in two populations. And what results do we get? We have three species, uh, brook trout, stomach uh, salmon, arctic char, and I'm not sure if people are familiar with these kinds of plots, structure plots, where each one of these lines indicate the uh, genetic composition of one individual. What is the, uh, the degree of admixture in the genetics uh, of uh, a single individual? And so what we see is uh, that you can find what's the most likely number of populations in, 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 in this analysis, and this, uh, ah. Oh, sorry. Oh, there, there we go. Um, and um, uh, it, in this case, it was three uh, uh, salmon in, in the pond one here above the waterfall are quite distinct from uh, no brook trout. Sorry, uh, quite distinct from the remainder ones, and, and these ones above this waterfall are also quite distinct. And it seems to be a, an isolation by distance pattern here. The degree of, of blue seems to increase all the way up to P5. So for salmon, we have the same. A population in pond one is different. Uh, two or three are distinct from three, uh, four and five. And then we have very few salmon in the other ones. The char uh, showed no structure whatsoever. And you can see that when you force the system to show you two populations and they are 50, 50, 50. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, what's the degree of structure uh, in each one of these species? Uh, Salmon salar has an FST of 0.2. Char has an FX, uh, uh, one order of magnitude smaller. Where I'm going here, one, uh, bear with me for a second, uh, brook trout is intermediate. So we have three species, three degrees of uh, spatial structure, uh, uh, differing one order of magnitude in the FST estimate. We can then estimate effective size for each one of these subpopulations, salmon, brook trout, char, wherever we found them, and enough of them. And so we have these estimates, and those are details with or without. 
can we use this information uh, to estimate the metany? Yes, we did that. Um, <coughs> And we used uh, those analytical methods that I showed you before, that table. Uh, this is the sum of the NEs. These are the analytical methods developed by the theoreticians. And this last value here this last, is one obtained with a numerical method developed by Tapto and Hinder uh, from Norway uh, some uh, a decade ago or so. Uh, which is based on the vector of, of uh, individual effective sizes and the matrix of uh, gene flow, asymmetric gene flow between pairs of populations. So it's calculated. And what we see is that none of these analytical methods made any difference with these systems. Some other ones they made. But here, uh, they, they're, you, know, you just go, can go with the sum of the individual NEs and you get an idea of the total effective size. This one is the only one that gives a smaller value, and only for some of solar, you see less and less of a difference in the other two, which uh, have FSTs quite low, 0 0.02 and less than 0.2. The only one for which uh, we had a difference was this, uh, the sum of solar, which has an FST of 0.2. So um, with that numerical method that uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, that, that we use and takes into account the degree of connectivity, the actual gene flow among the populations which you estimate. You can estimate with your genetics. And so, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, coincidentally enough, uh, there was a paper by Boris who is here. Uh, uh, um, unfortunately, I haven't met him, but uh, uh, um, there was this paper which we read in 2009, which spurred quite uh, uh, some uh, uh, interest in, in my group and so uh, <clears throat> what he brought into the table is that spatial uh, or they brought into the table spatial fragmentation per se is not the whole story that the uh, a arrangement of uh, the population the spatial arrangement of the but also bears uh, an influence on the effective size and that is that uh, when you have freshwater systems or you have composed of headwater populations that uh, connect and have downstream lakes uh, that collect individuals from uh, the different headwater populations, you have hierarchical dendritic systems. And under those conditions, you could indeed have a situation where the effective size or the diversity of the entire system may end up being higher than diversity in a, in a panmictic system of equal total size. So we're going full circle. And that's, uh, that's because each headwater population is experiencing uh, drift independently. And so the diversity uh, uh, in the headwater populations is maintained. And so you end up with uh, downstream populations having higher diversity because it collects the alleles from the independent headwaters. So you have to have hierarchical uh, dendritic system and asymmetric migration downstream. Everything. So this prediction has not been tested, um, reinforcing the, uh, at this point, 2010 I, or 11, was trying to get funded with a strategic grant in Canada along with, uh, with uh, Oscar and uh, <coughs> This citation by Robin Waples came uh, 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 work where he was arguing that yes, we need more tests because it's a lot of uh, analytical work, but little, little done in the field. And here we come with this work that we're uh, doing in, in Northern Labrador, quite uh, a remote and uh, um, inhospitable place. Um, <clears throat> Uh, with a much more comp spatially complex system in red lakes that are headwater systems in blue, the downstream, downstream systems. And what you have is, is a series of, of lakes here in the Barrens, up in the, in the plateau. It's all barren ground. Uh, you can see it barely here, it's too much light. And then um, the, the systems eventually drain onto these uh, rivers that this, uh, the, the whole of Labrador is this uh, tundra and plateau, the barren grounds they call them, 
and uh, cut by these fjords. Uh, in this case, is the the Kogaluk River system. Um, that uh, well, then you have a Cabot Lake, and this drains onto the Atlantic Ocean. This is a picture of the lake. That up here is the plateau, and those systems are up in the in, in the plateau in the Barrens. Uh, so here's where we uh, some pictures of the field work. We do this by uh, very expensive work that by helicopter with the province, otherwise it would be impossible. Um, Barren grounds, very shallow lakes. Uh, we're looking at three species, uh, lake trout, suckers, long nosed suckers, and the whitefish. Uh, they all exist in that system. And again, one, one structure plot as before, when we do the analysis of those uh, lakes, uh, we initially see that the systems north of the fjord separate from those west and south. That's the first analysis, first level. Then you take each data set separately and you detect more variability within. The two northern lakes are different from the four southern ones, always north of the fjord. Four lakes uh, west and south of the fjord, these, uh, these four lakes, including Cabot, uh, uh, differentiate each other right away and it's not surprising there is waterfalls separating each one of them. And then you continue on until you see no more difference, like we see in these two ones that are uh, fairly widely connected. So uh, <clears throat> just to round up, this is a work that we're trying to uh, uh, model now uh, <clears throat> with Oscar involving the three or four species that uh, we're working with in, in Labrador. And, uh, uh, with that, uh, I think that I talked about the role of life history, uh, variance, uh, variability, the role of mature par in the maintenance of genetic diversity, at least in the running salmon, the uh, gene flow, and I talked about the temporal dimension to asymmetries in, in gene flow uh, and the magnitude, and this uh, topic about spatial fragmentation and uh, finally, the, the work is funded by NSERC, uh, province of Newfoundland, Labrador, Parks Canada. And with that, I thank you for your attention. We only got it, uh, oh. that long-term study was only for one river. Only one, only one river. Uh, I don't, we don't have information, but you could see in that table that I show that uh, uh, overall the median was 85%, um, but there was some variance in, in different years. Right? No, I don't think there was a, a, a trend. Um, we don't have such such long, uh, or to my knowledge, uh, uh, there isn't a, uh, the data set for uh, 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 going back for 30 years. It doesn't exist. We may have some, maybe some some uh, individual samples for some of the other rivers. But uh, the, the beauty of that study was the, the long term uh, dimension. And uh, there was, there have been some studies by uh, groups in Europe. I think uh, in Spain, looking at the role of mature parts, uh, there were short, short-term studies. Just one or um, similar ones, yes. But only for uh, considering uh, two or three samples. Uh, uh, nothing such long-term. And I'm not sure about the uh, the degree of influence of the mature part. The, had influenced, but um, can't recall if the uh, it was so high as it was here. <coughs> Excuse me. I think that's just not in Yes. Yeah. <coughs> right.
have a question for I, I don't really work with the coach part. Do you have any evidence of a coach of males in isolation being able to trigger an African female performance? No, I don't. This seems to be a crucial question because you know it's, it's all about the evolutionary stable strategies and there's still an advantage that I was going to see. And if you have a population with no anatomy of males, it's gone. So I'm, I'm really surprised that it's important for the males. Yeah, that's the, yes. Yeah, it, it's a, you're right. That's an interesting uh, observation. You do need the anatomous males, or you may need the anatomous males to induce the females to spawn. Uh, because of, of all, all the, the the mature part do is to sneak in during the the the, uh, the, the I don't I don't I I would be lying if I said if I give you the, the some of them do yeah. yes. Some of them do. I don't have the numbers, but I know that uh, in, 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 uh, they do, some of them do. Uh, majority may uh, li likely to die, but, uh, but some of them do. <clears throat> I've never seen them myself, but I've seen photographs of one mature female part here in Scotland, and he's supposed to be male. But I doubt it's actually going to be a great one. Yeah, indeed. Have you charted no uh, different populations that people are isolated by waterfalls? Um, yes. Yeah, so <coughs> right. Uh, the Arctic char were not found on the uh, up. Uh, we didn't. Uh, those three populations of Arctic char that I showed are uh, three central populations. We didn't find enough. Uh, Yeah, and uh, so these are see a uh, pond uh, two, three, and four, and very few individuals in point five and six, and I think we got none in point pond seven, and the reason the the uh, there is no structure, at least with these markers, is that the, the uh, if you if you look for them at the right time, you find out that they are extremely abundant. There's so many of them. We tried catching them in the summer, co collected nothing. We went back in the fall, and uh, we were ex extremely successful. And they were active spawning in September, October. And so my guess is that uh, in previous studies, studies uh, done in the 70s uh, in, that, in that same system, <coughs> showed that they were uh, uh, much more abundant than salmon and than brook trout. And so I think there's an issue between abundance, population abundance, and degree of, of, of connectivity. Yeah, there's just lots of them that move around. Can I have one last question? Yes. Looking at sea level rise, and we showed a lot of structure there, how the scale samples are taken over the entire season, and they're representative of the population. Yeah, yeah. The one that it seems to be largely isolated is that the one that uh, uh, we've been collecting the samples uh, um, <clears throat> that we have samples for since since uh, so early. Um, let me just go back. Right here, uh, northeast Repassi. We had samples from. I don't can't read it, whether that's 85 or 95, 91, 97, 2000 and something or 2000. So <clears throat> maybe they don't go back to the 80s, but certainly since the early 90s, they, they seem to be quite different from all the rest. No, uh, there's hardly any multi-sea winter 
fish in any of these rivers. Hardly any. No. <coughs> Okay, so it's uh, 2 o'clock. We thank again uh, Tanya for his talk. Thank you. Thanks for your attention.